Well, there is no bigger name in fixed ops than the gentleman that we are about to hear from. He is a great friend of the fixed ops community and uh, a legend in all he has done in our industry. Please welcome Les Silver, everybody, the executive chairman of Dynatron Software. Les, welcome back to the Fixed Ops Roundtable. Ted, it's always good to be involved with, with your events. Uh, you know, this one tied in with the NADA should be just a, a super duper event. Less, I think so. Uh, you know, as you and I have discussed, a lot of fixed ops folks do not get all the love in the dealership. And it is such a great thing that we can invite them here to this event, uh, complimentary. And uh, they get to hear from some of the biggest names in the industry. And uh, Les, you always uh, do not disappoint. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn the show over to you and uh, look forward to what you have. Thanks so much, Ted. Uh, with the theme, you know, being a sports-related theme, I thought I would tick off the, or work off that myself uh, and spend some time talking about how do you build a winning service and parts team uh, utilizing sports as the analogy. So service and parts managers have a lot of responsibility in their dealerships, uh, and their responsibility is to build a winning service and parts team. Uh, what lessons can we learn from building a winning sports team? Uh, March Madness is coming on, and uh, all the country is enthralled with what's going on in the basketball. Uh, just finished with the Super Bowl. Uh, lots of lessons can be learned from sports uh, that can transfer into business. So let's look at what are the ingredients of having a winning sports team. Uh, first of all, recruit the right personnel, have the right people. Second of all, utilize the talent that you've got, both coaching and personnel, uh, to develop the right playbook. Thirdly, you need to teach that playbook. Make sure that all of your staff are conversant with it uh, and have the ability to be able to execute to the best of their skills. Fourth, coach the playbook. Uh, you've got pre- and you've got during game activities going on, uh, you need to be able to utilize your coaching staff, both as teachers prior to games, as well as in-game coaching. Understand the key performance indicators uh, that lead to winning. Uh, stats, particularly in sports these days, are becoming more and more important. And then finally, repeat, rinse, repeat, do it again, and again, and again, and again. So let's dig into a little bit of detail on each one of these things and see if we can provide some enlightening insight on how to build a winning team. First of all, on the personnel side, the foundation of any winning team are its people. You just can't get anything done without the personnel that have the capability to execute. They require a number of things. One is they require skill in the job function that they have. Second of all, the, ca the capacity or the capability to be able to learn is very important in your personnel. The attitude that they take to the job, and I call it the do what it takes attitude, the ability to be able to step up and understand the situation and step in where necessary to make sure that customers are satisfied and the work is being done properly. And finally, you need the willingness to be a team player. You're not there by yourself. You're part of a team. And to be part of a winning team, you have to have that skill set. Of these, if you look down the list, skill, capability to learn, do it with a take attitude, and willingness to be a team player, many people concentrate on hiring people for their skill. I think that's actually the least important of the four. If you hire people for their skill, typically what you're getting are people that have done it for some time before. That can be a benefit, but it often comes with a price. And that price may be ingrained attitudes um, and habits that may be difficult to break. If you have the capacity or the capability to learn and the right attitude and the willingness to be a player, you will over time develop the skill necessary for the job. Uh, and I would put that uh, to be the least important of the uh, of the various skills. How does your recruiting process 
identify these intangibles? Well, very often you find personality testing as a capability or as a tool available in the industry. There are a number of players uh, that provide customized testing for service-related jobs. Um, use it. Uh, you'll find that it is able to delve a little bit more into the personality and the makeup of the people uh, and give you an opportunity to be hiring and recruiting the right people to build the winning team. The second is the playbook itself. Um, in sports, every winning sports team spends a lot of time and effort and to create a well-developed and, very importantly, written playbook. Uh, they don't just talk about it and assume that people are going to remember. It's in writing, and it's there to be referred to on an ongoing basis. In your service and parts departments, that playbook consists of your processes. And there are numerous processes that your staff need to be executing in order to be a winning team. The processes need to be documented. They need to be written down in a step-by-step -step fashion so that you have the content of your plays in a written playbook. Now, one of the questions that gets asked, particularly in sports, is do you write the playbook with the skills of the players in mind, or do you recruit the players based on their ability to execute the, the plays in the playbook? And there's no pat answer to that. Sometimes it's a little bit of both, depending on the team that you've got in place uh, and their capability to adapt to the playbook that you want to develop, then it may be that you're going to accentuate the skills of those players. Otherwise, it may be that you write the playbook, uh, recognizing that you're going to have to go out and recruit a team uh, that are willing and able to execute that playbook. The content of the playbook can and often should be modified on an ongoing basis to incorporate improvements. Those improvements could be in personnel, where you might have somebody new coming on uh, that has a, a skill that allows you to run a different play, uh, or other tools that you may uh, bring into your arsenal. Uh, today, so much new technology is being applied to the parts and service business uh, that has to be reflected in the playbook. Uh, so you want to write your plays that assume uh, the best use of people and appropriate applicable tools. Once you've developed the playbook, it's now a matter of teaching it. And how do you go about doing that? Well, one of my heroes is John Wooden. Uh, John was the legendary coach of the UCLA Bruins basketball team for many, many years, uh, a legend in the industry. He developed a four-step process for teaching explanation, demonstration, imitation, and repetition. And that's what he utilized as his methodology. First of all, you explain the process. Second of all, you show it because people learn not only by listening to something, uh, i.e. the explanation, but by seeing it. Have them imitate the process and then repeat, 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 repeat. John Wooden would say the goal is to create habits that can be executed reflexively so that you don't even have to think about it. When you're in a situation that comes up, you know which play to execute, and you're able to do it without a whole lot of thought. Teaching generally is done outside of game conditions in something called practice. Uh, and in all sports, a tremendous amount of the week is spent in practice circumstances. And that's what allows skills to develop and for the playbook to be ingrained. How does that compare to your organization? How much time do you devote to practice in order to be able to build skills that allow for improved execution? If you're honest, you'll probably realize that not much. Uh, very little time uh, is devoted to practice compared to the amount of time that's devoted to game conditions. Coaching the playbook. In most sports, there's a significant investment in time and effort and expense associated with enhancing the performance of the team 
through the coaching task. Uh, and coaching has become way, way more specialized. If you look back 20, 30, 40 years, and you look at the number of coaches and what their job responsibilities are, the coach to player ratio has increased dramatically over time. Is that because people want to spend more money on coaches? Or is that because it was recognized that the more coaching and the more specialized and skilled the coaching is, the better the performance of the team is going to be? And that's an investment that is well worth its time, well worth its while. This involves real-time game management. You see the coach on the sidelines, very involved in the game. In many cases, sending in plays. It involves reviewing the game films after the fact, uh, where you're able to look for positive and negative uh, elements of the game uh, and reinforce both the positive and the negative as you go along. It call allows you to then update your playbook uh, based on the integration of the experience that you had the last time you, uh, you went around uh, and make sure that it's as capable as possible to execute. And finally, one of the more difficult aspects of being uh, a sports executive, uh, either a coach or a general manager, uh, is the need to recognize when you have to execute a trade. Um, my philosophy is do all you can to bring along the skills of the players that you've got. But if you get to the point where you're still not getting the winning result that you're looking for, you can't hesitate too long to pull the trigger and make a trade. It can be painful, it can be difficult, but often it's necessary. Finally, the key performance indicators, the KPIs that lead to winning need to be well understood. Back in 2003, um, some of you may have read a book called Moneyball. Uh, and Moneyball talked about a concept called Saber Metrics. Uh, and those are concepts around utilizing data in a much more significant way uh, as an assist to managing and developing winning teams. Uh, in the old days, it was the insight and the gut of scouts and coaches uh, that drove performance. Today, no, today it's data. Uh, and since then, the use of data and data analytics as an enhancement tool for decision-making has become standard practice. All the teams utilize the Sabre metrics in both recruiting and evaluating the staff, as well as, you know, when do you go on fourth down uh, for the yard? What are the data tell you? The chances are of that being the right winning play more often than not. Often all that is driven from data. The same thing applies in your operation. The use of data and data analytics in managing and operating offers performance enhancement opportunities that are very, very significant. Finally, the repeat part. Many of you have heard this or seen posters with this. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. This was a quote from Calvin Coolidge way back when, and one that I've certainly applied to my career as a key tenant, persistence and determination. I hope that's a useful uh, review. Uh, I hope you've had the opportunity to digest some of that. And if you apply it, you have the opportunity to build a winning team. Ted, thank you for the opportunity. Les, you um, you never you never fail to amaze. Um, you mentioned a few moments ago about the great John Wooden, and I recall the story, and I know you as well, that when he started out the season fresh with his athletes, the first fundamental he taught was how to tie their shoelaces, if you recall the story, because John Wooden believed that fundamentals were so important to what we do. And, um, you know, when you mentioned the data analy uh, and analytics in 
our business in service and parts, uh, you have really championed those metrics and a new way to look. And you've put you put a whole new light on those numbers, Les. So on behalf of the Fixed Ops community, thank you for all you are doing right now at uh, Dynatron Software. You're very welcome, Ted. We always look forward to your, you know, bringing the industry together for these roundtables. It's, it's a unique capability and we're glad to participate. Everyone, um, if you want to reach out to Les Silver, his contact information is on the screen and um, uh, just a tremendous resource for the industry. And uh, Les Silver at Dynatron Software, on behalf of the Fixed Ops Roundtable, thank you so much. You're welcome.